for those who seek adventure, this is the Buffalo Roamer Podcast, sharing the people, places, and moments that make a life on the loose worth living. The thing that's going to stick out to you most is when they open up that plane door. The cold is something like you've never felt. The jungle is so thick. Even if you had a machete, you couldn't get through it. There's a huge blonde grizzly bear. And when it saw us, this thing put its head down, stomped on the ground, and hissed like an alligator. I just crossed this real stretch of desert and I was really suffering. I'm your host, Will Collins. I'm an adventurer, outdoorsman, and roamer of wild places. I've backpacked the Brooks Range, rafted the Grand Canyon, and have canoed from source to sea both the Mississippi and Yukon rivers. I live for adventure, travel, fresh air, and diving into the unknown. And now, I hope to share my passion with you on the Buffalo Roamer Podcast. Here we go, episode 80. Thanks for tuning in yet again. If you're just checking out the show, welcome. Don't forget to give it a five-star rating in Apple Podcasts or Spotify or wherever you happen to be listening. That helps the show to grow. And better yet, text an adventure buddy that uh, there's a podcast they might enjoy. Uh, today's a good one for you. Dean Klinkenberg is on the podcast, and it is brought to you by Fischel Paddles, fine handcrafted wooden canoe paddles. Get yours today at fischelpaddles.com. Use the code WILL for a free uh, wall hanger on that paddle. Also brought to you by SREgear.com and SRE Outdoors. They are a family owned and operated outdoor gear shop in Black River Falls, Wisconsin. Great gear, great prices at SREgear.com. Uh, today's episode number 80, Dean Klinkenberg is on the podcast. Dean is uh, an author. He is the host of the Mississippi Valley Traveler podcast. Also a website under the same name, MississippiValleyTraveler.com. He is a, uh, a study, a, a fan, a, uh, a lover of the Mississippi River, as am I. So really enjoyed chopping it up uh, about the Mighty Miss on episode number 80 of Buffalo Roamer Outdoors with Dean Klinkenberg. Yeah, excited to be joined by you, Dean. Um, I'm looking forward to the conversation. Uh, I've been following your stuff vaguely uh, for the past, uh, oh, I don't know, year, two years, maybe, maybe more. Uh, Your Mississippi Valley Traveler uh, exploits, I should say, uh, writing, blog, podcast, uh, and I've enjoyed, enjoyed following it. So uh, I've been looking forward to chatting with you and I've been meaning to reach out earlier and uh, now is the time to do it. So now is as good as ever, I suppose. How you doing, Dean? I'm doing great. And thanks so much, Will, for having me on the podcast. There's a few things I like more than talking about the Mississippi with people who are just as enthusiastic about it as me. You got it. Yeah, I am a uh, guilty. I am a, a Mississippi River lover, uh, a river lover in general. But uh, yeah, the Mississippi... Uh, uh, that's the one, man. Pulls my heart for sure. Uh, I, I canoed the entire length of it in 2017. Um, so, and I live about an hour and a half from it here in Northern Illinois. Not close enough. Uh, yeah. But t- tell me a little bit about uh, uh, a-, a. I got a lot of questions for you, but uh, just tell me a little bit about yourself, Dean, and uh, the work you do. Let's start there. Um, well, I, uh, I have not had a linear career path. Um, I, uh, one of those people who's bounced around a little bit over time. And uh, I started off my adult life really spending way too much time in school. And uh, I got a PhD in psychology and went on to work in a research institute for a university for a few years before I got kind of tired and burnt out on that. And it took me a while, but I figured out that really wasn't the best fit for me. But I've always been like an avid traveler and I love traveling. I thought, hey, why not write about travel? That could be a way to do something completely different. And I just didn't think there was enough uh, attention being paid to the wonders of, of life along the Mississippi. So I started putting out some guidebooks about the river and uh, uh, and still had to do other work. As you might guess, it's not exactly the, the, the path to fame and fortune, uh, writing about travel along the Mississippi. But it was a lot of fun. I have some great memories from those years. Uh, And since that time, I've just kind of expanded what I'm writing about. Like the Mississippi usually is at the center of anything that I work on. But now I also write mysteries set along the river. I have a natural history guide coming out next year that will cover the entire Mississippi from Minnesota to Louisiana. I have a book out on disasters along the Mississippi. So uh, just a lot of different things. And uh, 
always looking for what the next uh, next idea is going to be. Basically, it pays for my time uh, traveling along the river. So, hey, I hear you. It's awesome. I think it's been. Uh... Yeah, it's been interesting, and I've been uh, enjoying uh, uh, listening to your podcast too, which is one of the things you didn't mention there, uh, Mississippi Valley Traveler, and that's kind of the moniker uh, of all of your stuff. Is that fair? Yeah, that's kind of the umbrella brand for what I do, at least for the nonfiction stuff. Uh, um, I have a separate website that I try to use to promote fiction. It's just deanclinkenberg.com. So that's where the mysteries are described and where you can learn more about those. But yeah, Mississippi Valley Traveler is kind of my uh, my moniker. Very neat. Very neat. And uh, how did you get pulled into the Mississippi? What was your, uh, you know, what, what was your original pull and then what's kept the fire going? Um, my, you know, for me, really, I think I got really hooked on the Mississippi when I was in college. Uh, I went to went to school not terribly far from you, I think, uh, up in La Crosse, Wisconsin. Uh, and uh, I think I ended up staying there for six years. And I just fell in love with that community and that, that place along the river. Uh, I had kind of grown up in suburbs and in small towns. I went to high school in southern Minnesota in the middle of farm country wasn't really a lot to look at uh, uh, in that area. And uh, going to, uh, I, one of the things that I still remember very vividly was that that first drive we took on Interstate 90 from Albert Lee to Wisconsin. And as soon as you get within, I don't know, 20 miles or so, the road just suddenly starts to turn and descend. And before you, this incredible lush valley opens up in front of you. It's just, I had to pinch myself and, and check to make sure I was still in the Midwest because we're not used to vistas like that in the Midwest. Um, so that was a really good first impression. Uh, and uh, after that, like I just loved spending time uh, anywhere near or inside to the river. So I did some hiking around the bluffs and I'd bike down to the river a lot when I needed to, to do some deep thinking or try to get my mood reset a little bit and did a little paddling on the river around there. So those memories really stuck with me. Um, and later, you know, as I was looking for things to write about, you know, by then I'd taken several road trips along the Mississippi to get to know places I was less familiar with. And it's just kind of been one of those things, the more I've learned and the more time I spend along the river, the more I, the, the deeper I appreciate it and the more I realize there's still a lot more to learn. Hmm. That's great. I feel the same way every time, every time I go, um, Talk to me about your upcoming book that you mentioned uh, you're working on, The Natural History Guide. Uh, uh, get, talk to me a little bit about the book, and then if you can, give me a uh, give me an overview of the Mississippi River, uh, uh, a geological overview, and just kind of some facts about the river for somebody who maybe is not as uh, not as familiar with. Uh, I mean, they know Huck Finn, but uh, maybe that's the extent of what they might know. Yeah, I'm not sure Huck Finn would entirely recognize the Mississippi today uh, as uh, uh, he did, you know, if, if he came back and rafted today. But uh, and you probably know this too. I mean, I I don't want to um, focus too much on the things that are problematic right now. So let's take the positive side of this first. That um, I think the Mississippi is um, is something we take for granted in terms of the uh, abundance and diversity of life that the river supports. And that was really the main thing I wanted to emphasize in putting this book together. So the book is called uh, The Wild Mississippi, a state-by-state -State guide to the river's natural wonders. It's coming out from Timber Press next May, May of 2024. Uh, and uh, kind of half of the book, uh, the first half of the book, just kind of describes the ecosystems along the river uh, and then some of the plant and animal life you'll find in each of those. So there's a whole chapter just on the main channel and what swims in the deeper water and faster water of the, the main channel. There are descriptions of different kinds of wetlands and then the forests along the river, uh, the bluffs, etc. So uh, I wanted to really do justice to the variety of life that really is uh, the, the river ha is responsible for creating and supporting. And then the second part of the book is going to be a listing of places you can visit along the river in all 10 main stem states. So uh, it's all public lands. I wanted to provide kind of a mix of places that offer different experiences, 
So some of them are smaller little public lands that may just have some really nice patches of prairie. Others may just have really nice floodplain forests to visit. I just wanted to recommend places that gave you a variety of those experiences so you could kind of see the river a little bit more like I do. So uh, I, for me, like that's still the essence of the Mississippi. And I know a lot of people look at it and they think about transportation or barges or something like that. I look at the Mississippi and I see ab abundant and diverse life. 100%. I, uh, I agree. And I, I, I also see wilderness, which is, you know, maybe one in the same, but uh, it's such an overlooked uh, wilderness corridor uh, that is, yeah, supports so much life and so much, uh, uh, you know, wildlife and, and the beauty of it. And it's so abundant and wide. I mean, the whole upper Mississippi river, all of the islands, uh, and different back channels from the lock and dams. Uh, I mean, it's just intricate and, and almost untapped, you know, when, when people think of, you know, Yellowstone national park or Yosemite or, uh, uh, you know, even smaller ones that are so high on the list, it's like, it's just an afterthought that there's this wilderness corridor that's untouched, you know? Right. People will like spend a lot of money to travel to South America to take a boat trip on the Amazon. But, you know, you know, granted, our river has been altered a lot more than the Amazon has. But you can still you can have an experience similar to that, as you well know, as somebody who spent a lot of time on the water. Uh, you can have an experience like that right here without having to travel very far at all. And I, uh, this is one of the things that I, I'm hoping people do, too, is like, you, you know this as well, that uh, if you just pop in and you look at it for two or three minutes, you might catch a few birds or see a few birds. You know, there are a few things. You, but the more time that you get to spend on the water, I think the more you begin to have those experiences where you see a greater variety of wildlife. So, so was that kind of your experience in 2017? Uh, you probably got to see a, a fair amount of wildlife being out there for that, that amount of time. Yeah, absolutely. All, all kinds of wildlife, uh, abundant, uh, uh, everything from, uh, in Northern Minnesota, I had a black bear swim across the channel. Uh, I say channel at that point, it's just, uh, you know, uh, almost a Creek somewhat between a mm -hmm. Creek and a small river. Um, but, uh, yeah, I had a black bear swim across the river in front of me. Um, you know, untold number of deer, uh, obviously the, the bald eagle, uh, uh, is just extremely abundant. Um, yeah, fish, you name, you name it, uh, all kinds of amazing stuff. Absolutely. And I've been on, uh, a canoe trip on the lower Mississippi where we saw, I think three deer swimming across the channel, which is not something you see every day. So it's not quite as exciting as seeing a bear swimming, uh, in front of you probably, but, uh, yeah, it was, it was really neat. Uh, and I, there was a campsite around there somewhere, uh, called, I forget what it was called, but there's something with bear in the name, sleeping bear or bear, bear point or something like that. And I remember looking at it on the map thinking that, you know, that's where I'm going tonight. And I'm like, Oh, that's kind of funny. And then, you know, sure enough, find a black bear swimming across the, across the river, not too far ahead. Uh, I'm still that's interested cool. in, in getting some general factoids, but one of the things, I think one of the first things that, uh, I saw on your social media, uh, and maybe I, maybe that's what got me on your podcast, uh, was the saber tooth tiger, uh, uh, tooth that was found on a sandbar, I believe in the lower miss. Right. Just, uh, I, I'm going to forget the details of that off the top of my head, but that gives you a sense of the age of the river. Like, yeah, I forgot to do the factoid things, but um, from the best that we can figure out, you know, the Mississippi probably has been flowing for about 70 million years. Um, and uh, uh, that, you know, a lot has changed during that time. The river's gotten bigger. It's gotten smaller. There have been periods of time it carried perhaps three or four times as much water as it does now and times when it carried less. Uh, changed a lot during the ice age as the glaciers advanced. And uh, of course the channel has, has changed a lot over time, but uh, it's uh, it's got a very long history. And it's, I like to, to poke fun at my friends down here who uh, sometimes like to have that the fun spirited argument about whether the name Missouri or Mississippi should be the one that carries South from the confluence yep. of those two rivers. 
And uh, I like, you know, that's kind of my trump card nowadays is like, well, you know, the Mississippi has been flowing for about 70 million years and, and the Missouri River, as we know it, has really, you know, only been since the end of the last ice age. So we're talking maybe a million years uh, at most. But uh, so Old Man River definitely uh, gets, the, gets the honor of having their name carry forward. And so, okay, so give me uh, give me some general factoids about the river length, drainage, or just some interesting, uh, interesting, you know, tidbits you got. The length is uh, a little hard to pin down. I think the Corps of Engineers has settled on something like two thousand three hundred and fifty miles. You know, I forget the exact number. Um, it's shorter than it used to be because the Corps has cut through some of the meanders on the lower part of the river and shaved off, oh, what, 150 miles or so um, by straightening the channel. The river naturally would change its length anyway over time. You, know, you, you remember those giant meanders down south, and occasionally the river would, uh, you know, over time, as the river's current chips away at the outer bank, um, it, uh, it kind of creates its own new path. So those meanders will disappear. You get these... Uh, um, or oxbow lakes that still kind of dot the landscape in a lot of places. Those are leftovers from old channels of the river um, that uh, it left behind after it dug through a new area through that pliable soil down south. So about 200, you know, 2,350 miles long. The, the deepest spot is kind of at the uh, giant bend at New Orleans, which is about 200 feet deep. But for the most part, it's not nearly that deep. Uh, when you get above Baton Rouge in particular, typically, or I think we're talking 30 to 50 feet. And then by the time you get around St. Louis, uh, north of St. Louis, probably 20 feet would be a little more typical. And of course, where that bear was crossing, you know, it might only be five to 10 feet deep. <laughs> I think you're about right. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a lot of water, huh? It's a lot of water. So it drains about, uh, what, 40% of the continental United States. So uh, water that falls uh, and on the uh, eastern banks of the Rocky Mountains or the western slopes of the Appalachian Mountains will end up in the Mississippi River at some point. Uh, and uh, much of that concentrated into the last couple hundred miles or so. Like The folks down in Baton Rouge and New Orleans really get to see uh, a lot more of that water all concentrated into a narrower channel. Uh, the river used to have more places that kind of split off as it got further south too. These uh, um, they're called distributary distributary channels. So the uh, today you've got just a couple that are left. The uh, Chafalaya is really the main one, um, but historically there were more. And uh, so as you went further south too, some of that water would kind of uh, split off into other channels and find its own way to the Gulf, while the main uh, channel of the of the Mississippi went on into the Gulf of Mexico and, and built these lobes of land and built uh, most of Louisiana. It's f crazy thinking about uh, a 70 million year process uh, or longer, who knows, right? Um, and it's interesting with water too, because more or less the same processes are taking place on a minuscule scale for when you pour your glass of water on loose dirt to the Mississippi River scale, right? And uh, it's just interesting thinking about those uh, dynamics and then how that shapes the land and then in, in turn how that shapes history and the fabric of, of society. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, and you know, it's, it's, I, I, rivers are such great metaphors, you know, for life in so many ways. Like, you know, they're the old... Uh, sayings about you can never step in the same river twice because you know the water has changed and it's not the same water you're stepping in um and the river is sort of this is constantly changing in a sense because it's got new water coming in all the time and yet that same basic channel that same basic river is always there in front of us uh, but the river like over the the long lens of time has been through a lot of changes and will continue to change like for their example uh um, I didn't realize this was the case until I started researching the book, but the uh, glaciers kind of uh, compact uh, the ice or the ground. So the ground sinks when the glaciers are on top of it. And as the glaciers continue to retreat into Canada, the land is still rising. 
So as the like the Canadian Shield in those areas continue to inch up a little bit, it'll probably change the sides of the watershed for the Mississippi and send more water into the river. So sure. there's there's really every reason to think that and over right. the course of time the Mississippi is going to get bigger again. Now, sure. you and I probably won't be around to witness that. You know, we're talking <laughs> over a different time scale than human life, but uh, but yeah, the even the within the time scale of the planet, you know, rivers go through a lot of changes too. It's so fascinating the different phases and and history of it and scales of history of that river. Uh, like for me personally, the ones that are always interesting are, uh, you know, the like the early native the Mississippian era, like the mound cultures, and then you have your your. Uh, you know, later native cultures, like just before the, arri- the the arrival of Europeans, then you have the arrival of Europeans and you have, uh, you know, the coming of America and just all of that it, it happens within a really, you know, uh, uh, pretty close time period in the scale of, of the Mississippi River. And it's just all so integral to uh to, to where we are it's just so fascinating i'm wondering if you have a favorite uh a favorite slice of uh mississippi history like a favorite era mm, i'm still like you mentioned the mississippian culture i'm still really fascinated by them um i live in st louis and we have one of the great world heritage sites just across the river at cahokia mounds and uh i think we know a fair amount about some of the basics of that culture, but there's so much more we don't understand. Um, but it does seem like they were an extremely important um, culture in their day. And um, the city and itself was what, probably 10 or 15. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't mean to interrupt you, but yeah, give me a background on uh, both the mounds and the mound culture, because I think it's very, very little understood and very little known, even by, you know, your average person that, that these mounds and this, this huge society took place all right. You know, if you're in the Midwest, all right around us. Absolutely. And there are probably a lot more of these that we don't know about too, but the, uh, so the Cahokia, what we call Cahokia today, that city emerged about a thousand years ago and they were really only the latest occupants uh, in this area. Uh, we have evidence of human occupation along this part of the river and even further really along the whole river that goes back at least 10,000 years. So people have been here for a long time. And the way archaeologists think about this, they are different phases they describe uh, in how uh, people lived and what they made and uh, uh, the kinds of lives they lived, whether they were uh, purely hunting and gathering or whether they were you know, uh, domesticating some crops of their own. But the domesticated crops in North America, as I recall, go back at least a couple thousand, more than 2,000 years, actually. There were some crops that were domesticated like 2,500 or more years ago. So this was kind of a gradual process of cultures that built up over time. Uh, and the mound builders uh, kind of began about a couple thousand years ago. Um, a lot of the initial ones were concentrated more along the Ohio River, and eventually that influence spread to the west and to the south. So by the time Cahokia emerged, uh, the one archaeologist that I know, uh, or anthropologist I know, describes it as a Cahokia's Big Bang, that (laughs) uh, this culture just seemed to explode overnight. And there was this uh, wave of new construction that completely rebuilt this big city from scratch. And the city attracted immigrants from all over the central part of the country. And they can tell that by the, the types of pottery that show up when they do digs, that they aren't. Uh, associated with any other groups here, but they know where they came from. So this city just exploded and there were maybe fifteen to 20,000 people in the main city itself and thousands more in communities around it. And at the time, you know, that was two or three times as big as London. So hmm. this was a huge city, complex. They, they designed uh, a lot of their pathways and mounds uh, to align with lunar and solar cycles. Um, they were very good at math. Uh, they had a complex, complicated spiritual system. Um, just there's a, it's one of those times when I think, gosh, wouldn't a time machine where I can just observe, not interact with anybody, but just kind of watch for a little while, it would be really fascinating to go back there and see that culture at their peak. I agree. And so 
co, co, how do you say Cohokia? Coco Cahokia. Cahokia. That's near Cahokia. That's near the confluence of the uh, Missouri and Mississippi. Is that right? Yeah, it's almost directly across the river from the arch. You know, really, it's just like five minutes from the arch. So it's a little down river of the confluence itself. But I'm sure like the comp because you also have the Illinois River just kind of up river here. So you have this confluence of three big rivers. And on the Illinois side, um, the uh, the floodplain is very rich. Uh, all those years of settlement and uh, being brought in by those three big rivers. I think the uh, it was an area of great abundance uh, because of that particular, the geology of that area. So it had been attractive for people to live there for a long time. And then Cahokia just, you know, took, you know, took it to the max. And is there any, or what's the prevailing thought about what the mounds were for in particular? They were a mixture of, uh, of uh, functions. So some of them were purely ceremonial, like the, the tallest mound uh, we call Monk's Mound today it had uh, kind of, they speculate that was probably where the leaders lived. There were clearly some wooden structures that were built on top of it and uh, evidence that people lived on top of the mound. So I th- the assumption is that, you know, spiritual leader, political leader, something like that probably lived on top uh, of the mounds. Other mounds were burials. Uh, there were, when they excavated some mounds a few years back, many years ago, uh, they sometimes found hundreds of burials within them. A lot of them looked like they were also part of ceremonies. Um, some of the mounds were, I think, just uh, markers. So they just were were probably put in place to help mark the calendar or uh, the passage of time. So, uh, yeah, they, they, they would serve more than one purpose. Now, in other parts of the Mississippi Valley, uh, a little bit later, um, and for the most part, there were some mounds that were built like up around, not too far from you, kind of up around the Marquette McGregor area in Iowa at Effigy Mounds National Monument, you have mounds that are built in the shape of animals. Hmm. And those seem to be, again, nobody's entirely sure why, but it's a pretty good bet that they they were had some kind of spiritual significance and they might have had some significance for marking um, territory or who lived there. Uh, but you know those are built on top of the bluffs, so they're pretty dramatic locations to build these uh, structures in the shapes of bears and birds and that have and, lasted uh, all these time. Things. Yeah, I mean, you got to think about most of our structures wouldn't, I wouldn't think, would last too long. I mean, you know, if you have something unoccupied, uh, you know, metal rusts pretty quick, wood, you know, goes bad and. <laughs> I don't think today's WalMarts are going to be around uh, in a thousand years. So no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't guess so either. Hey, it's Will here. I want to take a moment to let you know about our show sponsor and partner, Fischel Paddles, makers of fine handcrafted wooden canoe paddles. I spent a lot of time paddling rivers and lakes, and Fischel Paddles are the best canoe paddles that I've come across. I use the Ray Special model myself, and I outfit all the guided trips that I run with Fischel Paddles too, because I think they're the best. Each paddle is handmade by Greg Fischel at his shop in Flagstaff, Arizona from a single piece of wood. What I love most is the shape and feel of the paddle. Other than being beautiful and efficient, it puts less strain on your shoulders and arms than a typical paddle would while actually giving you more control and finesse with each stroke. Plus, the shape of the blade just feels right cutting through the water. All paddles are customizable from the type of wood, whether that's cherry, ash, or maple, to laser engravings. And my favorite, which is the leather strap that Greg pins around the shaft so that it doesn't get beat up as you run along the gunnels, prying off or doing the J-stroke in the back of the stern there. So go get yourself a Fischel paddle now and feel the difference. Use the code WILL at checkout. That's W-I-L-L to get a free wooden paddle hanger with any paddle purchase. That way you can show off and organize that new handmade paddle. Check them out at FischelPaddles.com. That's F-I-S-H-E-L-L Paddles.com. Fischel Paddles, handcrafted wooden canoe paddles. Hey, it's Will here. Want to take a moment to let you know about today's sponsor, SREgear.com. SRE Gear is a family-owned and operated outdoor gear shop in Black River Falls, Wisconsin, and they have everything you need for your next adventure, whether you're camping, backpacking, hiking, paddling, or just getting out there and exploring. SREgear.com has the gear you need 
to get you to those places you love. I recently picked up a new Garmin InReach from SRE. I needed a new communication device for the guided canoe trips I've been leading. And after talking through a few options with the owner, Nick, there, he helped me sort out what I needed and get squared away. And that's one of the things that sets SREgear.com apart is the unbeatable customer service. Call or email with any questions and you'll talk with the owner, Nick, or someone there close to him. So before you go and buy any outdoor equipment from a big box store, be sure to check out family-owned and operated SREgear.com and be sure to use the discount code WILL at checkout for 10% off your first purchase. That's discount code WILL at checkout for 10% off. SREgear.com. Great gear, great prices, unbeatable customer service. (laughs) How about the expansion i don't know if you know much or or kind of the general layout of the expansion of european culture uh obviously much much later in in the history here of the mighty miss but uh i sometimes get it mixed up on kind of how it went and the importance of uh marquette versus uh 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 you know, some of the other explorers and, and, and kind of just give me a general rundown if you could about the gist of how, how that uh, expansion kind of went. Yeah. So, um, I think the generalization I would make from this is that the Mississippi Valley uh, had, uh, French, French and French Canadians that came here first while the, the English were kind of more on the East coast and in the Northeast. Uh, so the, uh, French Canadians in particular, well, actually it's not just French Canadians, but the kind of the French Canadians came from the North as they were looking for beaver for the, uh, fur trade. Uh, and then you had French from France who kind of came along the Gulf coast and settled New Orleans and, and started moving upstream from there. Uh, so the French were really the earliest Europeans for the most part who were, who had a, a significant presence along the Mississippi river and, they had kind of a, as I recall, they had kind of a different approach to like, they definitely wanted their fur, but they tended to build partnerships with the Native Americans they came across, whereas the British tend to be, let's say, um, more of a conquering mindset um, and dry, tend to drove people, drove those Native Americans away. So this is far more complicated than I could get into, but there was, you know, really from around the time the first Europeans came to this hemisphere it triggered a, a mass period of dislocation and disruption among the native communities in North America. And some of it was from disease, much of it was from disease, but there was also a, uh, a slave trade in Indians that disrupted a lot of the cultural interactions and, and, and cost a lot of lives. So uh, by the time the French even really started coming down the Mississippi Valley, um, a lot of those native communities had already been through severe disruption because of those factors. Uh, so, so they kind of moved up, you know, up from New Orleans and down from French Canada and really some of the oldest communities along the Mississippi are not, you know, it's not New Orleans, but it's more the places around St. Louis and down to St. Genevieve in this corridor. Uh, the city, there's, there's a city here called Cahokia, which where the name of the, the mound site came from, um, that was established in 1699. Hmm. Uh, so it's probably really the oldest community uh, uh, along the Mississippi. It's not New Orleans or Natchez. Uh, um, and there are a whole bunch of communities in this stretch of the river that French and French mission, traders and missionaries founded in the early 1700s. And then Napoleon lost a big war and uh, he ceded all of his uh, Louisiana territory to Spain. So for a period of about 40 years, the Spanish colonial government uh, ruled much of the Mississippi Valley. Uh, so, and that was just before, you know, the, uh, the Americans, before the Louisiana purchase and, uh, American got, America got control of the Mississippi Valley. And, uh, uh, I don't know if you know this or not, but, uh, and if, or if you can remind me of Pierre and Marquette, uh, and their importance or, or yeah, their journey, I guess. This year marked the 350th anniversary uh, of their trip. So there were some celebrations up in Prairie du Chien and a few other places commemorating that. I think they were, I think that was a very consequential trip. Uh, They were really the first Europeans since DeSoto uh, to spend much time along the Mississippi. 
And uh, they had, there had been some French missionaries who had spent some time among native communities up around the Great Lakes. So uh, they weren't starting from scratch. They had some intelligence already from uh, missionaries who were, you know, already uh, had been out there for a while, like a, a man named uh, Jean-Claude Alloway, who is probably the first one who wrote down the name Mississippi for the river. So uh, their their trip, uh, I think, uh, it, for one thing, it, it sort of established some contact with Native American communities they didn't have much contact with before. Uh, it started opening up windows for fur trade, and it gave them an idea of exactly where the river flowed. Even at that time, there was some um, some theories that the river flew to the Pacific Ocean. Uh, so after Marquette and Joliet, they they, they were sure, certain at that point that it actually flowed down to the Gulf of Mexico. Sure. They got down to about the Arkansas River and uh, were warned uh, by Native communities down there uh, about the uh, hostility they might face if they continued south. So they stopped at the Arkansas River and turned around and went back. Uh, so they didn't quite do the whole river. So you've got something on Marquette and Joliet already. You know, <laughs> that you did the whole river and they didn't. But uh, That's cool. I... Uh... Prairie du Chien. I, I, so I do uh, outfitting trips. I guide uh, canoe trips. And one of the trips we do is the Wisconsin River, lower Wisconsin. And we paddle from Boscobel, Wisconsin to the confluence of the mighty Mississippi right there uh, at uh, Prairie du Chien. And we start at the park there, uh, the state park. Uh, I forget what it's called. Um, Anyway, and we, we go to the top and there's an overlook of the confluence of the Wisconsin River and the Mississippi. And there's a stone there that says, you know, at this site in, I want to say, 1692. Does that sound right? Uh, for Marquette and Joliet? Yeah. Uh, 1673. 1673. Okay, there you go. 1673. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, you know, Marquette and Joliet paddled by this very spot. And it's just yeah. kind of cool to, cool to think about. And it's it's lots of places like that with the Mississippi where, you know, you know, for, for a fact that, uh, at least within the given area that the river has changed that, uh, you know, you're, you're standing darn near close to where, you know, people have for a long, long time, including lots of historical figures. Absolutely. So that's at the uh, Wyalusing state park, just South of Prairie du Chien that you're thinking of. I think. Yeah. Um, and that, I mean, that's, that's one of my favorite spots along the river anywhere anyway aside from the great views you know from the overlooks they have campsites that are right on the edge of the bluff so probably not a good place to camp if you're a sleepwalker um <laughs> but uh, other than that um i think it's you know there's your million dollar views that you can get for like 20 bucks a night so yeah it's and it's it's an absolutely beautiful spot there the confluence uh and all the hills uh every time i take people there they're blown away that a nobody talks about it more B that it even exists. You know, it, it feels like, uh, you could be in, you know, you name it Appalachia, uh, like, uh, you know, I don't know the blue mountains or, or, you know, it feels like all these different places where you could be, but it doesn't feel like Wisconsin. <laughs> and, Absolutely. And yeah, it's just, everybody's always blown away by the beauty and kind of the wilderness of it too. So, so how long does it take you to paddle from uh, Boscobel down to the Mississippi then? How long is that trip? That one's three nights, four days. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. It's a blast. Um, do you have a favorite section of the Mississippi? I know uh, I'm going to have to pick up some of your books. I'd like to pick up some of your road tripping books, but uh, uh, I'm interested in that aspect of the river too. I've never really done a road trip, but uh, do, do you have a favorite section of the river? Well, I know I'm not supposed to say out loud, like if I have favorite uh, spots or not, but uh, I, I, my my initial hook on, uh, with the river came on the upper half. And I, in terms of scenic beauty, I think it's really hard to beat that uh, river with the braided channel framed by those gorgeous limestone bluffs that rise up to 500 feet uh, on each side of the river. So I do like that a lot, but I've been lucky enough to be on some longer canoe trips on the lower Mississippi too. And I think with the, like when you get south of Memphis in particular, when you get south of St. Louis, really, but especially south of Memphis, there's a stretch there that 
does feel extremely wild that there are no bridges. Sometimes you won't even see any barge traffic. Um, and, uh, and that's, that provides a very different kind of experience. So I, I kind of think like on the upper part of the river, you can have these nice cultured kinds of experiences. You can have a beer and a burger right next to the river. I mean, you can drive right there and get out of your car and get a beer and a burger with a nice river view. You can hike these gorgeous trails and climb these bluffs and, uh, um, and you've got these nice river towns, these old river towns that are beautiful places to stay. But when you get on the lower part of the river, there are a lot fewer places like that. And I think what it offers is more of that wilderness experience. And uh, I love the fact that we can do that in the Midwest, you know, that people stereotype us as being this, you know, you know, cornfield after cornfield. And yet we have this incredible stretch of hundreds of miles where you can have anything, uh, a wilderness experience like you can anywhere in the world. Yeah, absolutely. And, and what I always think of immediately thinking of those, uh, uh, of that lower miss, you know, like you mentioned below St. Louis, below Memphis is just these big sweeping sandbars, you know, loaded with driftwood and, you know, you have the whole thing to yourself and I would go along and just pick up as much driftwood as you could burn and have a massive bonfire all night, uh, right on the river. It's just, it's tough to beat. Who needs to go to a Caribbean beach or a Florida beach when you've got those gorgeous sandbars right here, right? I know it. Yeah, I know it. It's pretty wild. Um, how about the books about doing the Mississippi uh, by car? Give me a little overview of what's possible of, of traveling the Mississippi by car. So there's a, a designated route that follows both sides of the river called the Great River Road. Uh, and they have you know a fair amount of promotional material through their own websites, but not th- anywhere near the detail like I go into. Um, I, I have just one book right now that covers the upper half of the Great River Road. So if you want to drive from Itasca State Park, where the river begins, to uh, where the upper Mississippi ends at Cairo, Illinois, uh, I have a big book that goes into a lot of detail about the places along the way and some suggestions about where to stay and eat and some of the attractions along the way. You know, if you did the whole trip, you know, if you went down one side and up the other, it's probably going to be close to 4,500 miles. Uh, so uh, you could you could do a lot in that time. So uh, I kind of <laughs> recommend people... Oh, wouldn't that be awesome? You wouldn't have to uh, um, rough it as much as you do in a canoe on a long distance canoe trip either. But well, it's interesting. Um, it's also again just... I guess, co- common theme of the uh, of the mighty Mississippi. You know, you hear of the one hundred and one coast. You know, of doing a long road trip along California and Oregon. You hear of you know people doing road trips from the states up to Alaska. You hear of people doing road trips. You know. Uh, up and down uh, the uh, Appalachians, but you very rarely hear of of the uh, ability to do the Great River Road. Yeah, and I think yeah, I'd like to try to set people's expectations for that too. So you know, some of the trips, like if you drive Highway One in California, you have scenic view after scenic view. When you drive the Great River Road, it's not quite like that. There are places where you have spectacular views. Um, but a lot of times the road wanders away from the river itself. So um, I kind of think of it more as uh, a chance to get closer to the the culture of the river towns. Uh, and then you've got these little spots where you can take advantage of getting close to the river itself. And if you have a, if you bring in a boat, you can find a way to get on the water. Uh, but driving the Great River Road, I think, is more about the cultural experience of being uh, along the river itself. Sure. Absolutely. Stopping into these river towns and, uh, and yeah, having a burger and beer along the way. Right. Absolutely. Like you can do that in probably a thousand places or more. (laughs) And then you should always save room for pie. Right. And especially we're talking Midwest and South, like you got to save room for a slice of pie after all that. What are some of your, uh, favorite river towns along the way? Well, Lacrosse is the easy one because uh, I lived there for six years, but I never get tired of going there. Yeah, I'll just pick a few that I think are really uh, that I keep going back to. I'll put it that way. I, uh, Bemidji, Minnesota. I I love Bemidji, and partly it's because it's you know it's this um, outpost in the north. You know, it's a four hour drive from Minneapolis, which already seems pretty far north to me. 
Um, so, uh, but it's, it's a, it's got a great mix of a, you know, it's kind of a college town, but it's also very outdoorsy. Kind of been there in winter. I've been there in summer and it's just as much fun. Um, just takes more layers in wintertime <laughs> to be around there. Um, I, uh, let's see, there's a whole stretch of towns between Minneapolis and Dubuque that are really beautiful little places. Uh, the towns along Lake Pepin, uh, you can do just a, you know, a nice, easy day trip by doing a drive around Lake Pepin. It's 70 miles, I think, if you drive the whole perimeter of the lake. And you've got um, six or seven gorgeous old river towns with um, art galleries and good places to eat. And, and there you pretty much have good views the whole time. Hmm. Um, let's see from there. Well, Dubuque is always fun to go to. It's a beautiful place. I love the Quad Cities. It's kind of, uh, it has a lot of the big city amenities without all the big city problems, it seems, or with maybe in smaller doses. But uh, that's kind of where I got started when I was researching the river itself. I just kind of at random started near the middle with the Quad Cities. And uh, uh, I, I have a lot of friends in that area, and I always look forward to going back there. Um. Let's see. Going south, like I'm just going to pick a couple, like South yeah, Natchez, it's yeah, the best. It's Natchez, the, Mississippi. That's what Love came Natchez. to mind for me, especially in the South. Yeah, it's just like the history, like the you you can kind of feel the 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 grit and mud of the Mississippi, uh, you know, through town and in the culture of just that southern. Uh, you know, charm and grit, and yeah, it, really cool. The blues, really cool town, huh? Good food. Yeah. And like, I, I like the contrast in life as you were uh, hinting there too. Like Natchez used to have kind of the, uh, well, let's say the, the red light district was next to the river at river level, but the, the city itself, most of the city is on a bluff. Uh, so the wealthier people would literally you know, look down on the, uh, on the red light district. But I like those kinds of places where you have both of those kind of living there side by side. So, so Natchez is really fun. Um, you mean New Orleans, obviously, but that's too easy. Uh, you know, <laughs> staple, right? Yeah, and you, I never get tired of New Orleans. So, what about uh, floods that have shaped the river? Uh, what, are are there a couple historic floods that uh, come to mind? Yeah. So in the disasters book, you know, I highlighted well four really, but I'll say there are three major floods that I think have affected different sections of the river. So kind of up uh, uh, in your area, more or less, in 1965 was a historic flood that uh, was early in the year. It was April, if I remember right. Um, and most of the re records for uh, flood heights were set in 1965 for communities from La Crosse to Winona and Red Wing and that area. In my part of the river, you know, it was 1993. Yeah, that was our big year, and uh, this was this year was the thirtieth anniversary of that big flood. So I did a, a couple of podcast episodes this year, kind of looking back at what's happened in the past thirty years and how the the lasting impact of that flood. Um, and then uh, probably the most consequential flood of all, though, uh, was nineteen twenty seven, and that was the one that uh, affected mostly the lower part of the river, so south of Cairo. Uh, all the way down to the Gulf, really, uh, the river was set records for heights for almost every community down there. It killed a couple hundred people and it, it busted through levees. It pretty much flooded the entire, you know, historic Mississippi Delta, you know, the, um, up to a hundred miles wide of, of water at some point, like it would have done on its own historically anyway, but, uh, our levees have cut that off. And, right. but that one, that one had huge consequences for public policy as well. So if you're interested in that, you know, there's a book called The Rising Tide uh, that uh, really does a great job of going into the details uh, of how consequential that flood was. Hmm. Have you, uh, are you familiar or have you heard the podcast uh, Bear Grease? Uh, it's called Bear Grease. Uh, the guy's name is, uh, oh, now I'm forgetting his name. It's from the Meat Eaters, the uh, podcast. But uh, this guy, you should listen to it. I'll, uh, I'll send you the link, but he does a three part series on the Mississippi and kind of the history and the importance of it. 
Um, and that flood is, uh, is a big part of it and, and kind of the reckoning, uh, as you mentioned of public policy and, and kind of the aftermath of, uh, of trying to tame the river, I suppose. Interesting. I'm, I'm hoping that we're finally paying a little more attention to uh, the consequences of all that engineering. I don't know how much detail they went into that, but, uh, I know uh, there is at least one book coming out next year that's going to take a very critical look at um, how much we've altered the river and what the consequences of that has been uh, by a guy named Boyce Upholt. So uh, I think that's coming out in June. So it might be good to watch for that book too. And what's uh, what's his thesis or what what's your thought on it, on where we stand and how, you know, I guess, yeah, the current state and then what, what happens going forward? Um, there's some big problem <laughs> on the Mississippi. Uh, and most of it, um, I would attribute to us trying to engineer the river for one or two very narrow purposes. So we, uh, we, we task the Corps of Engineers with preventing water from going into places where the river historically went to in the floodplains by building levees, but keeping enough water in for barges. So um, the engineering is really unprecedented in human history for what we've done to the Mississippi, but the consequences now are becoming, let's say a lot of us have known for a while, this was not good. Um, so on the upper part of the river, you have, um, siltation is a problem. You know, silt is filling in the backwater channels behind all the dams and that's removing important habitat for fish and wildlife. Um, it's probably... Um, I would say like the overarching message from a lot of this is that we're reducing the river's ability to support that diverse and abundant wildlife. And we're also causing more problems for us uh, in the long term, too. So we have uh, channelized the river to such a point that uh, the water has nowhere to go. And we have these periods now of more frequent heavy rains um, that are pushing the limits of the levees and, uh, to hold it back. And in some parts of the river, like, you know, on the upper part of the river, they're just seeing more frequent flooding in general because they're getting rain more often. Um, in the Gulf, we are losing wetlands really fast uh, along the Gulf Coast. And much of that is because of the way we've engineered the Mississippi so that it can't carry nearly as much sediment to rebuild land like the river naturally does. So Miss Louisiana is losing, has lost hundreds of square miles of coastal wetlands that are important especially if you live in New Orleans, because those coastal wetlands provide a buffer when big storms come in and help reduce the intensity of those storms. And uh, there's less and less of that to buffer the storms for places like New Orleans now. Hmm. And those are just a few. I mean, there are other issues. we But I think that overall, the, the main concern for me is just uh, we've messed up the waters, the river's natural water cycles, and we're reducing its ability to support a bur- uh, abundant and diverse life. And so is there a uh, manageable way forward from that or what would be steps to improve it? Well, that is a bigger task and uh, (laughs) maybe above my pay grade in some ways. I mean, it's easy for me to think about what I would like to see happen Um, in my dream world. And I'm sure a lot of people would disagree with me, but um, I think we should have a different group of people managing the river and making decisions about how to manage the river. You know, right now we leave it to engineers. Um, And, you know, I have no problem with engineers. They do some great things, but I don't want an engineer designing my food. You know, I I don't think we should be putting engineers in charge of making the decisions and managing the natural world. We should turn to them to help with things you know, for solutions for things that we want to do. But the people who manage the river should represent a much more diverse group of people and diverse um, uses that are currently represented. Now, the politics in that's a whole <laughs> uh, different story. Uh, it's a much heavier lift because the people who benefit from having the river managed like it does are not going to just say, OK, we're going to turn this over you know, to will and deem to manage. But uh, <laughs> But what would a different management style look like? No locks and dams? Wider levees? No levees? Yeah, the levees would, I think over time, you have to push the levees back and give the river more room. You have to reconnect the river to more wetlands. Um, you, there are lots of different ways to do this, but you know, 
Uh, some of it is that you just, you know, you, you don't have levees quite as tall. So some places would flood a little more frequently than they do now, but then you can provide compensation to people if they're farming in that area, for example. Um, I'm one who thinks the lock and dam system, uh, it doesn't make sense economically or ecologically. Um, I've looked at this a lot and I, um, I don't think any time in my lifetime, those are going to come out, but I think we need to have, um, a harder discussion, a more realistic discussion about exactly what we get from that system and what it's costing us. Um, and then maybe over time we can develop strategies on how to, uh, maybe eliminate a few. I've heard some people say we could probably have half the number we have and still have enough water for barges most of the year. Um, I'm not even sure we need to accommodate that, but, uh, but I may be an outlier in that way. And um, what, so, yeah, I, what, what, uh, what, obviously there's a cost to running them and maintaining them and all that stuff, a huge cost. Uh, but what, what are the big, uh, what are the pluses and minuses on both sides? Why why would somebody say that uh, we need those, and why uh, wh- what's the opposing view in that we should let the river run run wild? So I'll just you know look at it from this angle. If you're a farmer in the Midwest who grows corn corn or soybeans, you're probably going to sell most of that to an international market. So you need a way to move it from your field to those international markets. Um, and they, something like 60% of the, those products get moved on, uh, on rivers, particularly in the Mississippi. Um, so for them, you know, they consider it pretty important. Now, there's not, it's really not very important to anybody else. And this is the thing that's hard for some people to hear and maybe fully understand. But the amount of goods that we ship on the Mississippi has been declining for 30 years. Um, and there's every reason to expect it's going to continue to decline because it, we, coal and petroleum products have historically been a big chunk of what we move on the river. And it's not hard to imagine a future where we're not going to be using very much of those. So you're just kind of left with corn and soybeans and rivers are, uh, are good for bulk transportation when you don't have, you're not worried about time. You know, if you order a, an iPhone, it's not coming to you on a barge. You know, at no point in the process, I'm pretty sure, confident to say, does any part of that product touch a waterway? So uh, it's only good for very narrow types of, of products. Um, and uh, the a flip side of this, too, is that we pay for it. So, you know, when we drive on a highway, we're paying a gas tax every time we fill up our gas tank. And that gas tax, depending upon the year, will cover somewhere around 70 to 80% of the total cost of highway construction. Um, historically, it was higher than that, but we've overbuilt, so it's less and less now. With waterways, the barges pay a diesel fuel tax that goes into a trust fund that can only be used for new construction that costs at least $100 million, and they cost share. Everything else is paid for out of federal tax dollars. So all of the costs of operating, maintaining, uh, those systems, all of that comes from you and me uh, and all of our friends and family. And because those systems have caused a lot of ecological damage, there are federal programs that are trying to restore the river, rebuilding islands, rebuilding habitats that have been damaged by those navigation structures. And again, that's all federal tax dollars. So I, the way I think about this, that's that. So you're getting it from both sides there. <laughs> Yeah. Pain for the so problem, pain to I, clean up the problem. Exactly. Yes. That's how that's how it looks to me. And I'm sure people in the industry would take issue with that, but they're wrong. So <laughs> uh, hey, I asked I asked for your opinion. <laughs> yeah. So uh so I kind of see this system where we you know, because this is um federally this is funded out of federal tax dollars, I think the farmers have artificially cheap transportation on waterways. They're not paying for the real cost of this system. Whereas if they have to ship by rail, that's a private system that's all funded by the railroads themselves. So we have this sort of public system that's competing against private railroads for the same cargo. uh, And it's really just for the benefit of a small niche of, of farmers. Hmm. Interesting. That's probably more than you wanted to know, but <laughs> no, I, I asked the question because <laughs> uh, I'm interested in the intricacies of it. Uh, 
couple more and then we'll start winding it down. Um, any, are you aware of any, uh, any sunken ships or any historical, uh, sunken, sunken artifacts or anything along those lines? I am not the best expert in that, but I know like there's a Facebook group, uh, Mississippi river photos. Are you familiar with that? Yes. Yes. So there are people who sometimes post pictures of old wrecks they come across, especially right now, you know, we're in the middle of a drought and the river is lower than it's been in a while. Um, so occasionally you'll see some things pop up. Um, you know, I know it's not, a, it's not a wreck that's in the river, but if you go down to uh, Vicksburg uh, National um, Historic Park, uh, they have one of the ironclad boats that was built by James Eads to fight the Confederacy in the Civil War. So they pulled that out of the river and it's on display. Uh, I think that's a pretty cool thing to see because that was such a pivotal um, uh, boat during the Civil War. Yeah, I just think about uh, yeah the Civil War and all of the 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 importance of the Mississippi there. But then I think about that saber tooth. I don't even know if the saber tooth is the right <laughs> is the right word for it. But the you know North American saber tooth tiger, the tooth found in a sandbar in the Mississippi. I mean, it's just untold. Uh, uh, countless artifacts and pieces of history waiting to be washed away in some sandbar out there, you know, or, or washed back to the surface too. So like you probably remember from your, your paddling trip, like there's some giant gravel bars along the lower part of the Mississippi in particular, and they can be great places to find fossils and artifacts. Yeah, absolutely. There's, there's a lot out there. <laughs> Yeah, that's half the fun. Like that, those giant sandbars and and the gravel bars, you can just wander around for a couple of hours and uh, uh, probably fill up. You know, grab more things that you can carry back in your boat. Yep, I know what you mean, uh, Dean. I, I've enjoyed talking to you. Uh, where can we give give me a list of a rundown of your books and uh, especially the tie to the Mississippi and where we can find uh, them and uh, kind of get more information about what you got going on. So uh, everything is available everywhere books are sold. So that's one thing, important thing to keep in mind. But I do have a website, MississippiValleyTraveler.com. And on that site, I have photo galleries from all along the river. Um, I have uh, profiles of river towns uh, all the way from the uh, headwaters down to southern Missouri and Illinois. Um, and you can find out about the books there, too. You can buy some directly from me or uh, you can go to your preferred marketplace the main book right now for travel is called Road Tripping the Great River Road, Volume 1, and that's the book that covers the upper half of the river. Um, I have a book called uh, Mississippi River Mayhem that's about disasters along the river, like steamboat wrecks and um, disease outbreaks, fun stories like that. Um, and then uh, I have three mysteries that are set along the river. Let's see if I can remember their names. Rock Island Lines, Double Dealing in Dubuque and uh, Letting Go in Lacrosse, And next year, uh, The Wild Mississippi uh, will be out in May, and that'll be the Natural History Guide, and I'm really excited about that one coming out. Awesome. Well, I'm looking forward to uh, to checking them out, and I'm looking forward definitely for that uh, Natural History Guide. I'll, I'll pick up a copy for sure. Thanks so much, Will. I appreciate uh, the invitation and the chance to, to chant and slightly rant a little bit, so... You got it. You got it, Dean. It's been a pleasure. Uh, we'll leave you, leave you, and let you, uh, you know, get back to dreaming about the Mississippi as soon as we hang up, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks so much. And there you have it. That is episode eighty of Buffalo Roam Outdoors with Dean Klinkenberg. Mississippi Valley Traveler dot com is his website. Appreciate you holding it down with Buffalo Roamer Outdoors. Uh, we're kicking things back up here uh, in the winter and gearing up for 2024. Uh, it will be at Canoe Copia in March of 2024. So if you're uh, heading out to the world's largest canoe and kayak expo in Madison, Wisconsin, hit me up, say what's going on uh, uh, at the booth, and I'll be doing some speeches as well at Canoe Copia in March of 24. Uh, check out buffaloroamer.com. Lots of cool stuff going there. Uh, trips coming up and all kinds of fun stuff. I uh, should have a new fishing blog coming out as well. Uh, I leave this weekend for a alligator gar fishing trip, which is going to be awesome. I kind of got some obscure fishing blogs on buffaloroamer.com hidden up there. Uh, so if you're into fishing, check that out. Uh, 
Alligator Gar is going to be an awesome, crazy trip. So I've been on the bucket list for a while. Um, yeah, if nothing else, get some fresh air, go get outside, and catch you downriver. <laughs>